What if your next team workshop delivered the results you hoped for? What if everyone believed that the working session was a valuable use of their time? And what if they felt inspired to take action right after? My name is Miriam Hatness, and it is my mission to help you to deliver workshops that work. Today with me on the show is Marcel, journalist, writer, publisher, and podcaster himself. I reached out to Marcel after listening to his show on deep listening. So today we'll speak about power and how to handle power differences in meetings and workshops. Welcome to the show, Marcel. Thank you, Miriam. And thank you for hosting this um, recording in your place. Oh, hosting, yes. Yes, yes sure. So, sure. Um, <laughs> beautiful sunshine outside. Um, and we I'm, are inside. So. <laughs> we're inside, but at least I can see the blue sky from inside. So um, I introduced you as journalist, publisher, podcaster. How would you consider yourself? What would be your hashtag? Hashtag? Um, uh, well, I, I think... I think, um, you know, it would be something like communication thinker <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, the tech line of my communication agency is also think clearly, communicate effectively, because I think if you want to communicate effectively, you have to be aware of, you know, what you want to achieve, uh, who's in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, you know, everything I do have has to do with communication. Uh, to some extent, whether it's mass communication, which is related to my previous job as a journalist, mm -hmm. or whether it's interpersonal communication, which is more part of what I'm doing right now mm -hmm. with my meeting strategist podcast um, and with, you know, the coaching and the training uh, that I'm embarking on. Um, so, yeah, communication thinker. <laughs> would be it, I guess. Communication thinker. Yeah, does that sound all right? <laughs> I think that sounds brilliant. <laughs> I really like that. Um, and today we are we are meeting to talk about power differences mm -hmm. in conversation, in communication, um, yeah. and namely in meetings and workshops. So, how did you come up with this topic? What's your story behind it? Oh, that's 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 a long story. I think it started already in my my teenage years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, back then, I was a little bit of a nerdy guy, and I was really, you know, most of my life was about thinking and writing back then, and I was really interested in philosophy. Um, and for some reason, I became interested in the concept of human wandering, uh, mm -hmm. which is basically, you know, taking a premise which is not necessarily true, mm -hmm. and then you build on that. And that leads, you know, to, you know, for people to wander and to deviate from reality. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and later on, I found out that that had more to do with biases and these, these kind of things. <laughs> Basically, your profession, right? Uh, economic, yeah. you know, behavioral yeah, like economics, that kind of yeah. stuff. Uh, but to some extent, it had to do with, power for me because when I went into journalism and became an editor-in-chief one of my main things was that I you know looked at journalism and I thought journalists are too much looking at each other mm. and uh, you know and they uh, sometimes start their stories on a false premise and Uh, you know, because of peer group pressure, mm -hmm. because of, hey, this newspaper has this on the front page. Why mm. don't we have that story? Um, you know, they create the same stories, all of them. Um, you know, and at some point I, you know, was one of the founders of a news agency that wanted to change this dynamic in journalism and create a new flavor at the source of news stories mm -hmm. to make sure that journalists don't look at each other, but they look at the prime source of stories and, you know, base their stories on reality and then do their own thing. Uh, and use their human capabilities to create their own unique stories. Um, so, you know, when I was at some point um, invited on national television to talk about this kind of stuff, you know, when I was uh, an editor-in-chief, um, a, a former social psychology professor, Mark Mulder, saw me on television and liked what I, I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And he sent me his book about power because he 
was you know a really prominent uh, power expert and you know that was you know the start of you know a very long friendship um he unfortunately died two years ago at the age of 93 uh, so he he had a long and rich life uh but um you know i worked with him a lot to talk about power and um uh, one of the things he tried to do also is to reduce unproductive unpro- power differences mm-hmm. in meetings in conversations in mm-hmm. organizations he was on a couple of supervisory boards mm-hmm. and sometimes he was hired as a consultant to look at power dynamics within boards mm-hmm. uh, to make sure that you know the company still had the right dynamics going on to be productive and effective mm-hmm. um, i think it, it's a really long answer to your question but that's how it started and um so and Mauk was also, you know, really one of the most influential people in my life when it comes to power theory. Mm-hmm. And what you say makes me think of so what you said about journalists looking at each other makes yeah. me think that what you actually want in journalism in order to find the truth is to find each other's blind spot and not to look at each other but to maybe challenge each other and reveal the details that the other one doesn't see and in order to have this kind of conversation you cannot have these power games right uh i'm not sure if i get what you're saying uh, uh usually you know the other journalists that i'm talking about are your competitors Ah, okay and so it's not um, your colleagues yeah. so it's so it's basically okay. you know there's so many ways to report on the truth and there's so many ways to report on the story or mm-hmm. you know you know, if we would consider a press release the origin of a story, which which it's not, because reality is the origin of a story, there's so many ways to write about yeah. a single press release, for example, and so many angles. And if there were not that many angles, why would you even need journalists? You would just need one, and then you would, you know, <laughs> create an algorithm and, you know, create different stories out of that one story from a journalist. And one journalist would be the market maker, so to speak. So if you want, you know, to have a flourishing sector with, uh, you know, in the Netherlands, a couple thousand journalists, Mm -hmm. they have to do their own unique thing and they shouldn't be looking at each other too much. It's a, you know, really plays into that whole, you know, really the stuff that you're interested in, like herd behavior and and group pressure. And it's really prevalent in journalism. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also one of the big dangers Mm -hmm. within journalism because, you know, there are now robots and mm-hmm. algorithms. And if you don't show why humans have a role in journalism, yeah. you know, being their unique selves, you, using their, you know, uh, curiosity. And, and storytelling skills. Storytelling yeah. skills and, and, and uh, you know, all the stuff that you cannot capture in an algorithm. Yeah. If you don't use that, then, you know, every year 5%, 10% of people working in journalism, you know, lose their jobs because, you know, there's no added value. So that's one of the things I guess at some point I said like in a, in an interview and, you know, mind you, this is like 15 years ago, uh, like 10 years from now, like 50% of all journalists journalists will be out of a job um and uh that was just like you know i I was just (laughs) just picking that number out of thin air um but the main thought was you know we have to look at you know who are we as human journalists and Mm -hmm. how can we add value to this and and you know it means not copying press releases and you know writing stories based on that but just going out talking to people yeah. and getting the story from the streets and and doing it in your own way and looking at the stuff that you find interesting yeah and in um the conversation we had just before we pressed the record button you um, yeah <laughs> you mentioned the phrase information gathering conversation that's what you did and for me, this is a perfect link between what you did as a journalist and what you're now doing as a coach and as a consultant, um, that you lead information gathering conversations. Um, and then you also, you had a 
for me, inspiring definition of what a workshop is. You said that a workshop is a po power neutral way of communication. Yes. Can you elaborate what you mean by that? Yeah, I, I think if you look at the word uh, workshop, you know, it has work in it. Uh, and, yeah. and, and for me, it's really the essence is whether it's in, in the form of a training or whether it's a workshop to find solutions to problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, you want to activate the people in the group because you want to get the best out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise, what's the point of having a workshop in the first, first place? So it's a tool and it provides tools. The, the workshop platform provides tools for, for activating people, for making people mm -hmm. think. And, um, you know, one of the, you know, if you want to do that, you cannot have unproductive power. Mm -hmm. Because if if there's, you know, power in the room and it's not being addressed, then um, people, you know, there, there's one of, you know, one of the big neurological effects of power is that when you lack power, um, you know, you know, being powerless affects your, you know, the executive function of your brain. You know, mm -hmm. it basically mm -hmm. impairs your ability to think. You know, mm -hmm. there's lots of... You know, MRI scan research, neurological studies that show that um, power really makes people who are on the other side of it mm -hmm. stupid to some extent. And, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, the financial crisis happened, because mm -hmm. people just blindly followed their financial advices. That's, that's also one of the first studies in this, this area, by the way, that came out like 10 years ago. But The main story is, you know, it impairs your executive function of your mm -hmm. brain. So what you want to do is activate people and, and make them think. And that's already one of the ways to reduce unproductive power differences. How would you define unproductive power differences? It's to me, it's it's power that gets in the way of a genuine connection and, and, and a real conversation. Um Power has a certain phys physiological effect on people mm -hmm. and it has a neurological effect mm -hmm. on people. If you want to have a real conversation and you are threatening me all the time, for mm -hmm. example, using coercion, which is a way, you know, one of the forms of power, um, I feel intimidated. Um, fight my flight brain mode. shuts down and... I will be trying to get away of the conversation mm -hmm. and that's not a good <laughs> basis for, you know, great things to happen for, for people to, you know, put their best selves uh, yeah. uh, forward and, you know, showing up in the best possible way. So, so that's, yeah, that's in a nutshell what, what yeah. unproductive power means to me. Yeah, I've never seen a person being scared and inspired at the same time. No, that's a good <laughs> point. That's a good point. Yeah. And uh, that's... That's exactly it, um, you know. So, I think the neurological effect and and what it does to your body mm -hmm. um, is is really important because it's really hard to es escape when it happens. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah. And I wonder, given that power differences exist, we cannot cancel them out. Well, there are a few organizations who work on a management-free. Um, hierarchical free basis but I think most of the organizations um, still rely on power differences so what causes this negative impact of these power differences how do you mean that so for instance there are there are bosses there are middle managers there are different hierarchies in any organization yeah so these power differences exist And this does not necessarily mean that they have a negative impact on the conversation or on a workshop structure. Mm -hmm. So what do you think causes this negative effect of power differences? Given that, let me rephrase it, we cannot change the way power is structured, but we can maybe impact the way these power differences impact the conversation. Yeah, I, I, if I, I get what you're saying, um, you know, I think power is everywhere in, 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 in any conversation. Mm -hmm. um, 
even maybe to some extent in the conversation that we're having right now, but we are both making a really conscious effort to reduce it mm -hmm. uh, because we want to have an open conversation. Um, and um, but 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 it but it's everywhere. And I think one of the main things that I'm trying to achieve is to make people more aware of it. That mm -hmm. even if you think that you are the most you know egalitarian manager in the world people on the other end on the receiving end mm. might still feel that you are powerful mm -hmm. and that power might still be affecting them mm -hmm. um, and it might still lead people to not come up with the ideas that they want to share uh, because they feel that you know they don't have the right to speak up um, and you might think like everything is going fine and smoothly and people don't bring a lot of ideas mm -hmm. you know to the table during meetings um, because everything is running smoothly but you know the other person might feel that power is getting in the way so if i understand you correctly according to your definition power differences must not necessarily be tied to differences in hierarchy but someone even to people of the same hierarchical position could have power differences. Oh, definitely. So if we look at, you know, the theory of power, mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of, you know, forms of power. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what you're talking about, authority, ah, is what I okay. would call formal power. That's, mm -hmm. you know, the name on the door, uh, the CEO, the position that mm -hmm. you have. Um, and, and formal power comes in many ways. It can also be, you know, the rules that are enforced during a meeting. That's mm -hmm. also some, some constitutional kind of power, so, so, so to speak. Structural it's power. Le legitimized power. Mm -hmm. That's another word for it. Uh, but you also have uh, expert power. Mm -hmm. And when you have two people, you know, of the same organizational level, uh, there might still be power differences between them because one is considered more of an expert uh, in a certain field than the other one. Oh. Um, and then there is something like charismatic power, mm -hmm. uh, which might, you know, cause, you know, a power asymmetry between mm -hmm. CEOs where, where one of them is like, you know, uh, like Barack Obama and the other one is, uh, you know, less of a communicator. Very um, interesting. Can you, and you said that it starts with awareness of these power differences. Yes. And just to come back to the last two sorts of power that you mentioned, the charismatic one and the one before with the expert power. Mm -hmm. right? How would you, in the framework of a gathering, of a meeting or a workshop, how would you help the participants to be aware of these differences and to become aware of how they might unconsciously impact the conversation. Oh, that's 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 a tough one because what I'm trying to do is, uh, well, by doing this conversation with you and through to writing, um, is to make people more aware um, ahead of meetings. Mm. Um, of the general impact of power, uh, you know, helping them, you know, recognize power and also that, that you know, power is to some extent a choice. There's something they can do to uh, make power more productive. And, you know, that's then the, the, the phrase that I use, like reduce unproductive power differences with credits for uh, uh, Mauk. Um, but, you know, during a meeting... Um, when you feel that there's power in the room, mm -hmm. maybe that's that's a place where we can go. Um, I think there it, it really comes back to, um, well, how do you notice that there's power mm -hmm. in the room? And, you know, I think it, you really m notice it when people don't share their ideas, when people mm -hmm. are keeping things to themselves. And sometimes it's unconsciously and sometimes it's consciously. Like mm -hmm. sometimes there's, you know, politics going on and people are not, you know, uh, you know, showing their true colors mm -hmm. because they feel they have to keep it close to their chest, for example. But, you know, there's also the more unconscious uh, manifestation of power where um, people feel, well, they don't feel free to speak up mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's no psychological safety. Um, if you notice that as a leader in the group, 
um, and a leader to some extent should be a facilitator, right? Um, you address that by asking questions, open-ended mm-hmm. questions, activating people again, you know, um, mm-hmm. activating their executive function, ma- making them think, um, and uh, listening to them, um, and asking them questions like, you know, what what can we do to go from A to B? What's holding us back? Mm-hmm. Almost coach-like questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, 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 another step would be really role model, and that's also a form of power, by the way, good listening. Yeah. Um, because when you demonstrate good listening by asking questions, uh, you know, keeping silence in between, paraphrasing people, like if I understand the you correctly, mm-hmm. did you say this? Um, you're really, well, role modeling listening, and that makes people you know, more likely to follow that mm-hmm. example. Yeah. And when people start listening to each other, uh, putting the focus on other people instead of themselves, I think you will be able to draw them out mm-hmm. and you will open the floor for a real conversation to begin. Mm-hmm. Before we continue the show, let me take a brief moment to thank our sponsor, Session Lab. Are you using Excel or Word to prepare and schedule your workshops? Try something that is designed for facilitators. With an easy-to-use drag-and-drop agenda builder, Session Lab allows you to be free and creative in your workshop process design. Session Lab also comes with an immense built-in library of workshop activities and facilitation techniques to help you to find new inspiration for your sessions. Stop messing with spreadsheets and focus on designing engaging workshops. Try it as sessionlab.com. I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't believe in its value myself. When you mentioned that there is this sort of power where um, participants might deliberately hold back information Mm -hmm. and this can change the entire outcome and flow of a workshop or a meeting, how can you help them to feel safe enough to share this information or maybe even force them, incentivize them to share the information without risking the safe space? Well, I I think that also comes down to role modeling. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think as a leader, you should, um, well, using the word leader, but it could also be a facilitator. um, You should show humanity uh, by going first and... um, you know, it reminds me to some extent of a book that you and I both love, mm. uh, Prija Parker's, um, mm. what's the title again? The Art of Gathering. The Art of Gathering. Beautiful book. And I remember a story in that book where she was sitting in a room with, I think it was a dinner in the run-up to a conference or mm-hmm. something. Yes, yes. And, um, and she, uh, you know, she wanted people to sort of, you know, drop their guards, really Mm -hmm. connect with each other Mm -hmm. because that's what you want at a gathering. Um, And I think she did that by, but maybe you remember it more vividly than I do, by telling a story about her teenage years. And I think it was about the first time she had a period or something Mm -hmm. like, 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 like that. And it was, in any case, it was a really personal Mm-hmm. Um, story that made her really vulnerable in the space. Yeah. But by doing it, she opened up the floor for more people to share their stories and to really, you know, come out. I And I think the rules of this evening was that everyone had to share one story around a specific topic. That was and it. Yeah. the last one who would share a story had to sing it. And this was the kind of trick to get to help everyone to come out first or earlier. And she wanted to set the stage, as you said, by telling a story herself and showing and role modeling by being so vulnerable herself. And and I think that's that's very effective. And um, I actually already listened to the podcast that you released yesterday. (laughs) With uh, Jeremy. With Jeremy Akers. Um, and I think he also um, uh, s- talked about this this issue mm-hmm. of you know 
sharing, like someone has to go first. Yes. And, you, you know, if, if, if there's something not going right in the room, it's also, you know, in, in trainings, which is more of my thing, sometimes there's resistance, for example. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you have to address it and it can be scary. I think that's, yes. that's also the stuff that you discussed with, with, with Jeremy. Um, uh, but it really works to go first because, you know, people won't leave you hanging there. Yeah. Um, they, they will, they will also come. And, and I think if you expose your own vulnerability, if you can express your own discomfort by definition or by instinct, your audience will connect to you. The participants will connect to you because that's how we, how we build up trust and bonds to each other is by opening up and showing our true selves because you are a human being right and you're showing your humanity and i think showing your humanity is really one of the ways to break through the politics Mm -hmm. uh you know through the concocting and Mm -hmm. the you know the 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 plotting uh and all that machinery Mm -hmm. um because it's also it's also artificial and and if you mm. then break through and and being an uh, you know a real genuine human um really helps and that's also why i think like some of the um tips from dill carnegie's how to win mm-hmm. friends and influence people i like that book so much because it's 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 really uh, and it's old and many of the things you know already mm-hmm. but one of the ways to neutralize, um, you know, a, a power difference uh, with someone is, and 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 it's also when you're less powerful, is to show real interest in the other person, mm-hmm. and um, you know, really making it about them, and then try to find common interests, and before you know it, you are friends with, uh, you know, a CEO of a big company or or whatever. Everyone likes to talk about him or herself. Exactly. I think that's the one thing we all share. It's one of these, you know, key principles, fundamental yeah. principles of human relations. And power is, of course, part of that sphere of human relations. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, being human and, and vulnerable, mm-hmm. I think that really helps. Do you have a trick on how to help especially those in power, to lower their guards in a meeting, maybe as a warm-up, maybe as a check-in? Is there something you could advise? I think the most crucial thing is to... um, And and then I'm going to draw... You know, I'm going to refer to some of the neurological research again. I just talked about, you know, the impairment of the executive function with, you know, powerless people... Mm -hmm. But there's also research on the other side. And when you have power, Mm -hmm. something else kicks in, an empathy deficit. And I Mm -hmm. think it's really important to be aware of that, Mm -hmm. being a powerful person, um, that you have to make it about the other people in the room or the other person in the room and not so much about yourself. Try to really understand what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, put yourself in their shoes. Mm -hmm. And, um, And that's also that... That might also even be a source of more power. Like if you go into a training and you think about, oh, maybe I didn't prepare, you know, that well and I'm a little bit insecure about it. Like, (laughs) you know, putting the focus on the other people, like it's not about you, it's about them and you are, you know, trying to help them Mm -hmm. and you are not more than a vehicle of change. Mm -hmm. Um, Really helps you you know, correct that mindset and, you know, go at it with, with the right attitude. Um, because, you know, in communication, like, it's hard, you know, it's really hard, but you should make it about the other person, yeah. you know, and good listening is not about you, it's about the other person. And it, it's, it's, you know, the bloodline of productive communication. Yeah. And this makes me think of um, my time when I worked with a group of very powerful people in an organization and I realized that they were actually quite lonely and they were lonely because they didn't receive any positive feedback. They didn't receive this warm shower of their staff members stepping up to them and saying, you know what, you're a great leader. I admire in you that you are a good listener or that you're taking care of your people. I like your vision. 
they don't get this kind of positive feedback. So I wonder whether maybe a warm shower exercise, um, I think it was Steph who mentioned that um, in a conversation I had with him, might help then the leaders to connect also to receive um, positive feedback and also to share positive feedback. And maybe this, what you just said, reminded me of this exercise. What do you think? And what, what is a warm shower exercise? It's that um, you would share positive feedback or positive reflection about everyone in the room. Just doing a round or something. Exactly. Yeah, I think that could definitely help. I think that also links back to that whole role, role modeling again, mm -hmm. right? So showing the um, behavior that you would like for, to have from other people, to see with other people. Um, yeah, so that could definitely help. And, and you know, the... the Well, the need to feel appreciated. Mm -hmm. That's one of these other, you know, fundamental principles Dale from Dale, Dale Carnegie's I started reading book. this book after you mentioned it because I was always thinking with this title, it cannot be good. And then you said, okay, ignore the title. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you and, were so right. And, it's and I, 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 I wrote a, you know, a, a tiny blog about it a, a few months ago, where I also, in which I also admitted that I always avoided the book mm -hmm. because I thought it was a gimmick. Yeah, and that was also <laughs> because of my own, you know, ignorance because I thought it was written by that billionaire, mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Carnegie, which is not true. That's a completely <laughs> different person, and they're yeah. not even related. So I should have done my research, but. When I finally opened the book, you know, I was sold. I think I, <clears throat> and it's really weird. You know, like, like I'm, I'm 40 now and I've been active in communication as a professional for like more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I opened this book for the first time and it's like the Bible for people in communication over Christmas last year. Wow. So it's really recent. Um, and I cannot say that I really learned something new from it. And that's the interesting thing. So why would I you know, recommend this book to everyone, mm -hmm. but it really puts it together yeah. in a nice framework and it, you know, offers great reminders and yeah. it's it's filled with anecdotes also and from people who are long dead, by the way, because that book was written in 1936, I believe. Um, but yeah, I highly recommend it to, to pick up that book. So Yes. And I observed that you were nodding when I mentioned the loneliness of leaders. And I would like to speak about ego mm -hmm. and the role of ego in power games. Because um, to me, and maybe I'm judgmental, maybe I'm to totally ignorant and you're gonna um, share your expertise have the impression that power games come from ego, come from vulnerability that tries to be hidden or to remain hidden. Um, yeah, like, like for an individual, that might be the reason why something like this, you know, like uh, why, why politics, uh, you know, emerge, um, being insecure. Um, you know, when I look back at my early 20s, Uh, I, for some weird reason, I rose <laughs> on the ranks of journalism pretty fast in my early 20s. I, I was an editor-in-chief, I think, when I was 22, 23. Wow. And, you know, I had this um, editorial department with a couple dozen people in it mm -hmm. that, that I was leading. Um, but I was not even, uh, you know, a grown man. I was, I didn't really know myself and... I was actually quite insecure. It's 22, um, it's quite normal. <laughs> it is quite normal, but, you know, I, I also had some sort of, you know, a, <laughs> um, a role model position, um, but I didn't really live up to it because I remember that I, I had like this separate office and mm -hmm. I really locked myself up there as much as I could to do thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um Well, I should have spent much more time with people, communicating, asking them questions, listening. But what I spend most of my time doing is thinking about my own strategies, theories, the kind of stuff that I was going to say, you know, in the media. Mm -hmm. um, and 
yo, that's, <laughs> you know, I was young, I was a kid, um, and I, I was probably not even ready for a position like that. But I think that's an example of where, you know, ego and increasing the power difference because that's what you're doing and mm -hmm. when you're putting a wall between you and yeah. other people you're blocking the conversation you're in increasing the power difference hey you have to knock on the door when you go see the editor-in-chief mm -hmm. like never mind that he's just 22 or 23 <laughs> but <laughs> i think i wasn't yeah i wasn't up to being a real leader and you know breaking down the walls and 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 you know potentially facing criticism yeah. and 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 difficult conversations with people who didn't agree with me you know now i would say bring it on you yeah. know i would like to learn from you and if you are able to change my perspective mm -hmm. that would be a great day when you think of meetings good meetings and bad meetings mm -hmm. what is the magic ingredient that distinguishes a good from a bad meeting well it's It's all about contact um, and being able to connect with each other. Um, if you have a meeting that really run by the agenda, for example, mm -hmm. uh, which is, by the way, a form of power, mm -hmm. um, and you, you really want to discuss certain points and there's no room for people to share their ideas, mm -hmm. then there's no contact, people cannot contribute, and it will have a rippling effect within your organization. Um, so, you know, contact, you know, connect, connecting with people is, 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 is crucial. And I think one of the things that we sort of unearthed Uh, or, or uncovered in this conversation is, you know, you have to be a human. If you go to corporate organizations, I see so many people playing a role. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have the feeling that I'm almost talking to positions mm -hmm. instead of people. Mm -hmm. And I think in a good meeting, in a, in a, you know, what is a good meeting? Do you, do you even need a meeting if it's not good? You know, maybe you should get good rid question. of it. And, yeah. and I think in a meeting, you, when you, you ask people to come in and for, you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes, the only reason why you would do that is for them to be able to bring something to the table. Information uh, gathering conversations, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, yeah you, you could say so. You know, if, if you are a leader and you want to make a decision, it's really important to be able to get the right information uh, to, to make that decision. And you want people to give you the right input about risks and mm -hmm. opportunities. Um, uh, so, yeah, to some extent, you're right. How would you... How can you manage to give enough space for information sharing and expressing yourself and still remaining within a reasonable time slot or to keep the agenda? Because at the end of the day, although it's a power instrument, there's a reason why we do have agendas. Otherwise, it's just a brainstorming session. Yeah. How can you keep the balance between contribution, connecting and still keeping The time boxing. I read this, or actually I listened to a podcast interview with Celeste Heatley um, a few weeks ago, and I think she has a really good solution for it. Uh, because th that is the difficulty, right? Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, I would like to this, for this conversation to go f on forever because mm -hmm. it's super interesting and fun, uh, but time is limited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and especially <laughs> within organizations. So time is a real element to, to keep into account. Um, and I think Celeste Heatley herself has a team that she leads. Um, mm -hmm. you know, she's a, a former journalist and she wrote a book about conversations. I still have to read the book, by the way, but I listened to a couple of podcast interviews with her. And she says, like, you have to separate, um, you know, the information gathering from taking the decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and what she means by that is, uh, you know, if you have a point on the agenda, uh, and I think in that podcast interview she talked about, you know, for example, the, the Christmas dinner party for mm -hmm. our team or whatever, um, she says like, okay, people, um, you know, w what are the ideas? Mm -hmm. And then she, uh, you know, uh, 
ask people to to uh, contribute to it and and it's always good to ask you know a coaching question like what else mm -hmm. yeah? to to also encourage all other people to share um, their ideas and then she says okay then we do this and then she moves on to the mm -hmm. next point so she says like one of the mistakes that people make is that they mix decision making mm -hmm. with information gathering and you have to keep mm -hmm. those things uh, separate there's another example that comes to mind by the way and um, I read a, a big Harvard Business Review case study mm -hmm. uh, written by Amy Edmondson who mm -hmm. is you know the uh, person behind psychological safety and she she wrote a case study about the Chilean mining disaster mm -hmm. you know right. when you know, these people were stuck in the mine mm. and they, you know, engineers from all of the world had to come together to uh, create a solution for these mm. people to come out. Um, and she said, like, the way they did it was to apply something she called, I think, duality mm -hmm. leadership. And that's on one hand, um, really calling the shots, mm -hmm. right, making decisions and being the leader, using your power, and mm -hmm. on the other hand, engaging people to share their ideas and to really have an open floor. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the basic idea is you have to be mindful that these things are two separate elements mm -hmm. and they are both really important. Um, you need to take a decision at the end and you have to do it within a certain amount of time. But you also have to you know, give room for people mm -hmm. to, you know, show it up in the best possible way and help you find the best solution. Mm -hmm. But then also be able to close the discussion. And this is maybe the positive use of power to just thank the group for their contribution, close the discussion and then move on. Absolutely, After because power point. is not, mm -hmm. you know, necessarily evil mm -hmm. or unproductive. Always it can be unproductive. But there are also productive ways of, yeah. of using uh, using power. You know, I, I think a really good example comes again from that book uh, written by Preja Parker. I would really encourage people to read it because I think it's it's brilliant. And yeah. I, I like the concept also of, you know, calling it a gathering yes. instead of a meeting. So, so I'd already named my podcast Meeting Strategist by then, but I sort of like the word gathering. Anyway, um, she, uh, you know, she sees really one of the things in the book is that you have to use your power mm -hmm. to create a good gathering. Yes. And one of the uh, points on which you want to use your power is, you know, purpose. Mm -hmm. you, you have to create a purpose uh, and you have to design your meeting around uh, a, a purpose. And that's one of the, you know, y and you don't want to be... I think she, she calls it like a chill host mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, who yeah. sort of, you know, you wants to make people feel happy mm -hmm. and then you become laid back and you sort of relinquish your power. And you said like, okay, can I bring my friends to the party? And you say, fine. But, you know, she says, no, 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 no. Then you have to use your power. Like if he's not going to contribute to the, mm -hmm. to the uh, you know, purpose of the yeah. gathering in the first place, you really um, have to show your power. And... One of the examples that I actually wanted to mention was that there was this consultancy company, I guess, that she talks about in her book. And uh, in the meeting, in the board meetings, board members were trying to postpone uh, uh, the decision making. Mm -hmm. And they were constantly asking questions about the information that was available mm -hmm. and asking for part. more yeah. information and then at some point the leader of the group imposed a rule which mm -hmm. is power um guys you know we don't add any new information mm -hmm. to these meetings these meetings should be about coaching questions mm -hmm. it should be about what's holding your back what should be our next step how am i supposed to do this mm -hmm. these kind of things so you can have a real conversation and people yeah. start sharing yeah yeah. And this also puts the participants to the meeting in the responsibility to 
get the information beforehand so that the meeting time is not used to just exchange information but to exchange ideas. Because you would be wasting the time of, I don't know, 12 people in a yeah. room. That's 12 times an hour or, or, or whatever. And, you know, one of the main things I'm, I'm trying to do with meeting strategists is, f you know, and, and that's also why it's called meeting strategist, by the way. The strategy side is really about focusing on the purpose of yeah. the meeting. And do you have to need to have the meeting in the first place? And do you need to yes. have all these people in the room because you know let's face a fact we are all meeting and i'm not doing it because i'm extremely conscious of it um but most of the people are meeting you know too much like they're in too many meetings that are not meaningful that mm -hmm. don't add anything and where they not necessarily contribute anything with their presence no yeah. because you know what happens and um You know, I had uh, y y in your introduction, you uh, reference to the deep listening episode mm -hmm. as part of my podcast. And deep listening is a term, um, as far as I know, introduced by Oscar Trimboli, um, who was my guest on that episode. Um, and and he, he says, like, you know, many people go from one meeting to another and they don't take time to settle down, organize their thoughts, mm -hmm. listen to themselves, and, and then go to the next meeting. No, they just rush into it. Mm -hmm. They check their phone once more. And that means, you know, some people, yeah, most people are so overconfident about their ability to listen. Yeah. Listening <laughs> is so hard. And no one, even if you are the <laughs> most incredible listening Jedi in the world, no one can really listen to other people and putting the focus on other, other people when you are distracted by mobile phones, distracted by your own stress, mm -hmm. your, you know, the rush to get home after yeah. the meeting because you have to pick up your kid. All these things, noise, you know, mm -hmm. all the noise, you know, it's, it's really hard to pick up signal when you're surrounded by all that noise. So you re really have to um, be aware of that. Yeah. I like the how you phrase it to pick up signal when you're surrounded by noise and signal being the signal of the person opposite of you whom you want to listen to. And I just had a look at the time and I have the impression that we could go on for another two hours easily. Um, we'll get back for a part two. Absolutely. <laughs> I was about to say that. So um, if one listener just woke up and missed the entire last 50 minutes, what do you want them to remember? Well, the, the main theme that we talked about was uh, power in meetings, power in conversations, um, and the ripple effect it could have within organizations. Um, and I think the most important thing is to be aware that power is everywhere. It's not only in the newspaper or on the TV news when we look at Trump and political leaders and war and <laughs> corporate boardrooms. Power is also in our daily lives. It's, it's everywhere. It's not necessarily evil, but it's something you have to be aware with, uh, aware of to make sure that it doesn't ruin your interactions. Um, and there's lots of things you can do to, to make that happen. But, you know, in the end, it all comes back to the main communication principles of being interested in other people, asking open-ended questionings, questions, um, listening. Um, and, um, yeah, I think that's what I would like people to pick up from this and, and actually, you know, to, to come up with a little bit of self-promotion. Power is probably going to be the main theme in the second season of my podcast, mm -hmm. Meeting Strategist, and I'm going to launch a whole lot of blogs on it mm -hmm. in the next uh, couple of months. So if people are interested, can I Absolutely. mention my domain name? Absolutely, this would name? have been <laughs> my next question, how we I'm can just, find you. You know, taking the power here myself. Please. Um, people can find me on uh, uh, Meeting Strategist. Dot org, um, which is the place where my blog and podcast uh, lives. And if you're interested in this theme, I'm going to, to be publishing, you know, a lot of material on it mm -hmm. in the next few months. Great. I'm looking forward to it. Marcel, 
Thank you for your time, for your space, for your energy and your ideas. Thank you, Miriam. Bye-bye. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.org to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day. Thank <laughs> you.